Good morning, Christ Hold Fast friends. My name is Bruce Hillman, and I am the pastor at Hillside Lutheran Brethren Church in northern New Jersey. And welcome to my basement, which is admittedly a creepy way to start things off, but um, it's much quieter down here than it is upstairs. My house is on a main road, and sometimes I can get a lot of uh, traffic noise. Well, um, I have my Bible here. I'm going to be using the ESV, and uh, I see the other presenters were talking about their coffee in the morning. I am not a coffee drinker, so uh, I have my tea, and tea always tastes better in a teacup. And uh, we tea drinkers need to stick together because we know that coffee is an astringent, bitter broth that reflects the dark hearts of those who drink it. And tea is, well, it's like a sunny disposition. It's like the zippity doo dah it's sunshine in a cup. And um, I know that uh, I'm not here to preach the gospel according to tea, but I thought I would say it all the same. Anyway, the gospel I do want to talk about this morning is the gospel according to the book of Ecclesiastes. And uh, if you have your Bibles, you can turn there or you can just listen. And uh, while you're turning there, just to give you a, a little background on that Old Testament book, uh, the book really is asking a very contemporary question, which is, what is the meaning of life? It's a question that's popular in churches and, and in our society today, and prosperity gospel preachers give one answer, and you can watch TED Talks or get a life coach and get another answer. But the book of Ecclesiastes provides a thoroughly theological answer to the question, what is the meaning and purpose of my life? Now, where the book of Ecclesiastes might fall a bit short on this is the writer of Ecclesiastes did not yet have the gospel because, of course, Christ had not yet come. And so when we import Christ into the book, or that is to say when we read Christ in Ecclesiastes, then we get this beautiful picture of um, really what it's like to live a life without anxiety. And so Ecclesiastes is a book that sometimes is accused of being overly pessimistic, and it certainly has its pessimistic moments, like this morning's reading, which will be in chapter 1. But that pessimism is a reflection of the author's understanding of the world as being broken, as a world that isn't what it should be. And if there's any pessimism, it's simply in calling things out for what they really are, as kind of unveiling reality and our lives and the things that we work for as being ultimately futile, as not being able to make any type of significant difference, which then begs the question, what are we to do with this problem that our lives seem meaningless or vanity or, or breath like the wind? Well, let's get into it. Uh, I'm going to read the first 11 verses of Ecclesiastes in chapter 1. And he's not going to answer the question completely for us this morning on, well, what is what is the purpose of my life? That's going to happen throughout the whole book. But he is going to set the stage on trying to figure out what ultimate reality is so that he can begin to answer that question. And so let's read verses 1 through 11. Here's what it says. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and goes around to the north. Around and around goes the wind, and on its circuits the wind returns. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. All things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it is said, See, this is new. It has been already in the ages before us. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of later things yet to be among those who come after end of reading. Wow, kind of a dark
dark opening, you might think, to uh, a book. But if you think about it, what the author is really trying to do is paint a picture for us of the futility of creation. Uh, imagine, if you will, uh, you're sitting in a theater, and you're watching this huge production on a stage in front of you. And this production is the cosmos itself. You know, you have the sun and it's burning and you have uh, the planets and they're spinning around the sun and you have supernovas and, and you have comets and you have all the liveliness of creation that's happening. And then as you zoom into Earth, you get this whole uh, ecosystem. Uh, you, you have the weather and, and you have the seasons and you have this cycle of life, this circle of life. So people are born, people live, people die. And the question is raised, what significant impact or difference are we, humans, able to make on this cosmic drama? And if you imagine, again, that stage where all this cosmic drama is happening, what, your, what my life and your life is like is if you were on the wings of that stage and you ran as fast as you could from one end to the other, and that's your appearance on the cosmic drama. You don't make a difference. Now, he's not saying that you, you can't have an effect on other people's lives, but he's saying that fundamentally, essentially, human life does not change things. It doesn't change the creation. The sun still comes up in the morning, the winds still blow around, the water still pour down into the sea, and human nature isn't changed. The eye is never content to see, and the ear is never content to hear. And that raises a significant question. What is the meaning or purpose of my life if my life has no significant impact on anything? Even if I were to do great things like uh, create some uh, you know, new political system or to create, build some great city, our cities fall to ruins, our political systems come, and then they get replaced by other ones. And ultimately, humanity is not able to make its mark it does not have any type of eternal significance that changes anything in the physical creation. Everything, therefore, is meaningless or futile, at least so it seems at first. Well, what he's uh, really giving us here is an allusion, I think, to Genesis. When the serpent looks out and, and, and says to Adam and Eve, look at the tree over there. If you have that fruit, you will be like God. And this is really the problem that the writer of Ecclesiastes is giving to us this morning. That human effort, human labor, human striving, it's like what he'll call later chasing after the wind. You can't catch the wind. You run after it, but you actually can't get it. Because it's a human attempt to be like God. So what does that mean? Well, what he's saying is that we toil, we live our lives, basically trying to bring the future into our reality. We try to control, we try to manipulate. Everything we do, all the actions that we take, are trying to bring ourselves a certain type of future that we envision. And we hope, on top of that, that that future that we can maybe create will have some lasting impact or effect. But the reality is, is it doesn't. It doesn't change the world. And even if we can change a life, that life will die, and a few generations later, no one remembers us. They don't know what our hobbies were. They don't know what we cared about. They don't know what we love. We become simply forgotten. And this brings up this uh, idea of reality that the writer has. That is, uh, life is a failed attempt to be like God, to try to control the future, to try to manipulate the creation and change things. And we just can't. Instead, what we need is a salvation from this futility, from this ultimate groundhog day that just keeps happening over and over and over again. So here's a good time to maybe import Christ into the book of Ecclesiastes. Because Christ, as God-man, as the incarnate one, he breaks in. He breaks into the groundhog day. He breaks into this incessant cycle. And he says, behold, I am making all things new. And this is something that only God can do. Only God has the power and the control and the ability to break this cycle of futility that we find ourselves caught in and to give us something on which to hang on to make sense of our lives, but also to live good lives. And that's what the book of Ecclesiastes wants, uh, wants us to eventually learn. Specifically, what the good life looks like 
is a life of worship. Now that comes way later in the book, but maybe we can begin to import it now. It's a life of worship, and because it is a life of worship, it's a life of love. And because it is a life of love, it is a life that should be, when it's operating correctly, free of fear. And this is what the gospel, according to Ecclesiastes, really gives us. In other words, because Jesus has broken in to the incessant cycle of reality, we don't live by effort or by skill. Instead, we live by promise. And this is something that, as Christians, we have, maybe you could call it an advantage over other people. Irreligious people live their lives trying to make that future theirs. They're constantly trying to manipulate and to control and to bring a reality into their present that they want. But the author says not only is that not often possible, even when that happens, it doesn't have any lasting effects. And so we're like a hamster on a wheel. But, but, what if we lived not by our effort or by our skill, but in the reality of God's promises? See, that changes everything. So in closing, let me just uh, unpack a little bit about what I mean by living in God's promises. A promise is a guarantee for the future that's given in the present. It's a guarantee about the future given in the present. But as the writer has just told us, we actually can't guarantee the future. The future's not in our hands. We, we futilely are trying to create it, but we can't actually do it. And so in a sense, we might be able to say that human promises aren't really promises at all because they can't actually guarantee what they promise because they have no control over the future and over circumstances and events. But when God makes a promise, because God actually can control the future, because God is actually someone who has broken into the cycle from outside and is making all things new, then God's promises, which are given to us today, actually have a guarantee of a future. So in that sense, if we live by promise, it's the only way that we can really have a guarantee of the future. Now, what does it mean to live by promise? It's simply to live as if God's words are true. And to be freed from the incessant cycle of trying to create our own futures. So God says to us, uh, I am with you always to the very end of the age. That's a promise. Or God says to us, um, be not afraid. Or uh, be not anxious for anything. But with everything by prayer and supplication, give your request to God. And the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Or, of course, Romans 8.1. For therefore there's now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. And so this morning, I guess the lesson that uh, I would have you leave with is simply this. Here it is. It's the morning and we have our whole day in front of us. And we have things that we have to do and we have things that we're dreading. Maybe you have to give a public speech this morning at work or you have to submit a report. Maybe your kid is sick. Uh, maybe you just had a breakup. Who knows? There's something in your future that that's going to be difficult for you. And what you're going to want to do is try to create, uh, manipulate your future to try to get what you want. Maybe you will get what you want, but most likely this is the way the irreligious live. They're trying to control their own destinies, trying to make their lives better. Now, the writer will tell us later there are things we can do, but for now let's just take this little note, which is simply live by God's promise. Um, remember, that no matter how much you may screw up today, that it can never remove you from under the umbrella of God's promises. That there's nothing you can do in this futile cycle of life that will take you outside of God's promises. You can't mess up enough where God's promises stop being true for you. And so if you live by promise instead of by manipulation, then you will find your anxiety level goes down. And that's what the book of Ecclesiastes is significantly about. And then on the other side of that, just to remind ourselves that we are not responsible to change the world. We're not responsible to change everybody's lives. That's what God is responsible for. Certainly he'll use us, and we can talk about that as we get into the book, maybe at another time. But significantly, essentially, the only one who's making things new is God. And that frees us then 
to live by that gospel word and that gospel promise instead of by our own strivings and our own efforts, which in the end don't really do anything except to increase our anxiety level and to, and to uh, give us a sense of not living by God's promise, but by our own ways. So I hope that that word goes well with you this morning. I hope you have a good day. And as, uh, as the old words say, go in peace and love and serve the Lord. Thanks for watching.